I'm talking too fast or you have any questions, um, please feel free to raise your hand and ask a question or tell me to slow down. That's, that's not a problem. Uh, I have lots of content to cover and I think it's better that everybody can understand than if I just go through it and, and everyone can understand. Um, before I get started though, I would like to briefly explain why I've chosen this topic. And um, I'm interested in reading because I think reading is such an unnatural, an, an unnatural thing. Um, because you know everybody can, everybody can speak a language, and, but not everybody can uh, read and write in a language. And I think that being able to read is a real. You don't know how to use it, but you know what they're saying to you. Does that mean you don't know the word? Because, you know, I sit in this class and I hear a lot of people talk a lot and I pretty much can understand what everybody is talking about and I can follow and when Professor Kerr asked me to give my input, yes, I can give it. So I must be able to understand, but I'm, I must be able to know those a lot of words, but I always respond in English, what's wrong with me? I don't, so I don't know those words. My point to this question is, it's hard to say how, it's hard to define how we know a word. Mm -hmm. Usually a teacher will uh, give some kind of test question, multiple choice, or translation, or something if it's for a second language, and then we, we maybe like for me when I was when it was uh, for my first language, the teacher will ask us to be able to spell it and use it in a sentence, and then the teacher thinks we know the word, but actually sometimes we don't really know the word, right? Even we can use it in a sentence. I can say he was a big blah blah blah, but we don't know what is blah blah blah, but it seems okay because the slot for a noun is, is open and we put something in. So sometimes as, uh, as kids or sometimes in our second language, we know something about the word, but we don't know everything. So it's hard to define what knowing a word means. Yeah. Okay, so now about vocabulary learning. Um, you notice I put a slash here. Later we will talk about learning and acquiring, but I want to know how do you learn or acquire new English vocabulary words? Rehearsal. In what way? This side, this side is very silent. <laughs> How do you learn English words? Oh, I keep a dictionary and uh, find the definition. Oh, okay. So you mean, how do you know which words to look up in the dictionary? Just keep a dictionary. So all you will just read the dictionary for pleasure? Yeah. Or fun? <laughs> wow. You're, is it helpful? Yes, yeah, it's helpful. But you know, I tried to I tried to do this with my Chinese dictionary before, but 
what I had what happened was I start to read the word and then the definition there are words I don't know and then, then I go to look up the the words in the definition and then I need to <laughs> and then I just say oh forget about it. <laughs> Do you ever have this kind of experience? No. No? Oh you're better than me. Your English is good. No no no. Okay. Alright, so there are a lot of different ways that, that people can learn new vocabulary words. Okay. So how about Chinese vocabulary words in Chinese? How do you learn new Chinese words? Do you know every Chinese character in that's ever been written? When you, when you pick up a novel, when you pick up a novel, a Chinese, a novel in Chinese, when you read the novel, will you know every single word, every single character, every word in the novel? <coughs> when I use the word no, it's very open to. of Chinese words do you try to do, do try to look see you're looking up so it seems like you really want to know more words so what kinds of words do you usually try to learn in Chinese? If I don't know how this words use in the sentence or so the, the things you're reading are novels or is it what? I don't really read really novels. So, is it on the internet, or? Oh, you don't know. <laughs> okay, so now about incidental versus intentional, because we're talking about incidental vocabulary uh, acquisition. Okay, so what is the difference between incidental and intentional learning? So you tell me what you think, and then I'll tell you what I think.
specifically about language. In other words, uh, incidental, incidental learning doesn't occur because they want to, like you said, not because they want to actually learn the language. They, they have some other purpose. Like for you, in your example, the purpose was reading an article. Yeah. But in intentional learning, yeah, just like your example, reading a book that says, oh, vocabulary number one, you know, and vocabulary number two. But I'm, yeah, I want to give an, an example just from first language incidental learning. And this picture is of a, of a kid and with, let's say that's his mother. And then they're, they're together and the mother is baking and then says to the child, bring me, the, bring me a bowl. But the, and the child just says, what's bowl? And the mother says, that, that's a bowl. And the child takes the ball and gives it to the mother. And the child says, ball. And then something happens inside the child's mind, and it just happens to learn the word uh, that, oh, this kind of object is a ball. But what was the purpose of the, the child and the mother interacting together? They're playing together, they're cooking. The purpose was not to learn the word ball. But as a byproduct of this communication together, the child acquired or learned a new vocabulary. So that is more like uh, incidental learning. But it can also occur in second language. Um, so this is, in, this is a picture of someone in Subway in Taiwan. So, Let's say, let's say the person goes there, they, they're very hungry. And um, the, the, she starts to order, and she orders a lot. This lady cannot speak Chinese very well, and she orders the things by pointing. But then, at the end, the, let's just pretend, okay, that the, okay, then the, the, the person selling things to ask her, oh, does she want a cookie? Okay, let's say she asks this, but this lady doesn't know what is being done, so she just says, she just shakes her head, and then the, the girl points and just says, do you, you know, being done? And then she just says, okay, and then the lady <laughs> says, in her mouth, okay. and then she leaves. Was the purpose to really learn the word for cookie? No. Her purpose was to eat because she was hungry. But as a byproduct of this interaction, she learned the word for cooking. So this is a type of incidental learning. Here's a picture of two foreign teachers teaching in Southeast Asia, and they're teaching English. So these students are in a class, and they're sitting down, and they're taking notes, and they're being taught. So this is intentional or there, it's on, on purpose, the student's purpose for being there is to learn the vocabulary words, to learn something. So this would be considered in, intentional learning. Okay, does anybody have any questions between Could Can and I share a story? Sure. Like a mother of a three-year-old girl, mm -hmm. and the mother will give a, a bowl of cereal mm -hmm. every morning to the girl. Okay? And the mother used to read from the box the ingredients, like, ah, oh, maybe you're going to have vitamin A, B, and such things, okay? So several weeks uh, later, a visitor went to their house. And the baby just picked up the cereal box and said, I am having a vitamin A, B, C. And the visitor was so surprised, said, oh, she's reading. But she's not. No. She's just imitating her mother's behavior. So do you call it intentional? Um, my question is, imitation, in, imitating, is, uh, is intentional or incidental? Mm. Well, it's a difficult question. I think for, for a child, so many things are... Incidental. Yeah, I think so many things are incidental. So I think they're like a, their brains are like a sponge and they're just absorbing everything. So 
I don't think the child is intentionally trying to memorize the ingredients, but and so I think they're just they're just repeating what yeah what they and I don't think that it's really they've learned something. It's just they've acquired just um, a string of sounds together. That will be my my take on it. There's no follow-up, but I, I just, I, my good guess is she will use, why would he date my I don't know, because, you know, in the U.S., there are a lot of stories, and we see this on TV a lot, there are these parents that will show all the president's pictures to kids, mm -hmm. and, then, and then the child is very young, like, um, not even two years old. And they just can speak and they can name all of the presidents, but they cannot really say other things. Mm -hmm. They cannot really communicate everything, but they can name all of the presidents. Yeah, they've memorized all of this, but they, I think it's because they just consider it a game. It's like a game to them, so they're playing, but that's a very interesting, interesting question. Okay, so would you describe your learning of English vocabulary as being more intentional or incidental in what? Intentional. <laughs> intentional. Do you all think it's all intentional? You all are trying very hard? Yes. If you learn English every day. I think if the vocabulary learning in the incidental learning process is more happened in the com communication situation. Mm -hmm. I think for our maybe second language learner, we can we seldom catch those kind of chance to have those kind of environment. For for, for you mean daily conversation? Yes, because your example about the uh, incidental learning. Well, I, I feel it's connected with the communication. It could be, yeah, but um, it doesn't necessarily have to be. Mm -hmm. Because, let for me, example. For example, if I'm sitting in this class and mm -hmm. I keep hearing professors say a certain word over and over again, and I cannot really understand the lecture, mm -hmm. so I will look up the word in the dictionary, and then it will help me to understand what she's saying. So, in that case, I don't really care about this vocabulary word. My purpose is to understand what she's saying. So in this situation, uh, it's an academic setting, but still maybe I will acquire some academic word. Maybe, maybe not. But um, that was not my purpose. But it sounds like you have two intentions. One is no, for no, no. understanding. My, my main intention is to only understand the content because I will write my paper in English. I think what Barry said is not the vocabulary. No. Mm -hmm. For understand what others talking about is one kind of attention, uh, uh, it's a intention. Uh, I understand what you're saying, but you, you have to think about where is your focus. If I'm saying the vocabulary is Yes, the vocabulary would be, in that situation I just described, if I learn some vocabulary, the vocabulary will be incidental. But what is intentional is the idea I'm getting from the class. In, in every kind of situation, any kind of teacher. For the example I gave before about food, the intentional task was getting fed, get some food for me to eat. And the incidental was learning the word for cooking. Mm -hmm. So in every situation, there will be something that would be incidental. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing something. And in every situation, there may, with language involved, there's going to be some kind of incidental learning taking place. Uh, I try to think those kind of episodes, just like this, is I have an intention to get food. This yes. is my first intention. Yes. Then I found I can catch I can touch uh, I can catch the goal because I can understand the word. 
Right. Then I have to switch my intention to understand the word. Then I can catch catch the food. But actually, you don't really need to. In all all situations, you you won't really need to. You won't really grasp. Maybe you will grasp the word, but maybe you won't grasp the word. Mm -hmm. But still, I think the main purpose of this interaction will be always the food. Mm -hmm. You won't you won't stop not wanting the food. Mm -hmm. If there is a really bad situation where the seller refuses to sell you anything because you cannot speak the language he is speaking, then yes, then your focus may shift to language. It's possible, yes. But I can guarantee most of the time the person selling the food, they just want to sell the food so they can sell to the next person. They will do whatever they can do to sell you the food. Can I give you another example like Zhong Jie, Jie Mian, or Nai Mi? We learn these vocabularies from you know, somewhere, but we never really learn what this Nai Mi or Jie Mian means. And that's incidentally, we just pick up the vocabulary. So, if you want to know the word, you can see that. 界面，你可能还想说，哎，从来没有看过字典去查过，对不对？那你也没有查过、啊，可是你就不搞那个东西了，就像饼干。嗯哼。But I understand what you're saying. Yeah, but there always be a, a focus. Yeah. How about Chinese? So I think we can we can go on about this one. So I mentioned earlier about learning and acquisition because I've mentioned the word um, acquisition. And uh, this may be something that would interest you too. I have a big quote here, but I will just explain very briefly. Krashen is a researcher that is um, really hot on incidental learning. To him, he thinks you can learn all of the vocabulary that you need to learn from reading because he believes that only when, only when a person is not focused on the language will they really be able to acquire the language. If you are focused only on the language when you're, learn, when you're doing some type of task, you will only learn the language. And he distinguishes acquisition and learning by, excuse me, he uh, distinguishes acquisition from learning, meaning that uh, acquisition will be something deeper, much like your first language, where that is not the focus of the that is not your focus of the text. Like when you are focusing on language and not the communication or not what you're you're freely enjoying to do, like reading a novel. When you focus too much, too much on the language, uh, it's hard for uh, you to get it. The proper amount of input, so there will be there will be some. Maybe you will feel too nervous, or um, you will be worried. Oh, I'm going to say the vocabulary wrong, and because of this, you will not progress. But he thinks, oh, when you're very relaxed, and just like in your first language, when you when you uh, when you acquire a first language, you don't try to acquire; it just happens. So he thinks for the second language it should be the same, the same kind of thing. It should be automatic, not pushed, not stressed, but just in a very calm and relaxing way. But of course, there are some people that don't agree with this. Some people say, oh, it's impossible to acquire a second language. You can only learn it because you have to focus on your cognitive ability and use your cognitive ability to be able to learn the language because when you're a child, you have some, you have a, your language acquisition device, some other, something else that is helping you to to get this language. So, but I think we don't have to worry too much about this. It doesn't really involve, in, I think, in the research. But I just wanted to explain to you the reason I use the word acquisition is because most of the studies. They are not telling the students to learn the vocabulary. But wait, 
Yes. If I press the series, then see here, we can give you a comprehensible input in low anxiety situation cognitive message, and then you have to turn our English classroom upside down. Right. Yeah, we and it also it that, and, you, and it also means that you have to, um, you have to give the students a lot of time. Yeah. Like maybe you have to say to them, it's okay, you have 50 years to learn. And the teacher had to send a message that students really want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but how can you get comprehensible input if you're in a, a foreign language environment? Like in Taiwan, mm -hmm. you walk outside this classroom and you hear Chinese. So there's no way to get the input. Mm -hmm. But like in the US, maybe it's easier. If you don't live near the Latino mm -hmm. community, you will walk outside and you're going to hear English and you'll have to use English so you're going to get more input. Yeah. But it has to be in yeah, low anxiety situations. Any comments, questions? And this is a sneak preview because I have some ideas at the end, but I want to get you to think about this, about context. So what does the word context cause you to think about? Context. And you can think about any kind of language environment, reading or interacting with people. I just think about which kind of situation when I learn a word, I will, I will check the context about the word. You will or will not? Oh, I will. You will. Yes. That's good. That's a good way. Not just the first definition in the dictionary. So mm. that's a good learning habit. I think. Um, so, you, so I think we've already discussed mm. this, like how, what is the role of context. So context will influence the meaning of the so now I'm going to get into the theory. So actually, why is this even an important issue? It's an important issue because uh, second language learners need to learn you know, thousands upon thousands of words in English. And actually, research has reported that there are a lot of different types 
you write flashcards or writing the words or saying the words over again. There are all these different techniques that students are using to learn vocabulary words and then in the end they don't learn any vocabulary words or they learn very few. So this is a this is a topic that should be pursued because if it is as easy as Krashen and some of the other researchers have stated, then we need to be as teachers need to be promoting more uh, reading or trying to focus on what type of context or what kind of ways can we help uh, students instead of just trying to teach them every every word and. Um, Let's move on to the next one. So what does it mean to know um, a word? So I mentioned this earlier because you know a lot of uh, researchers have already found, have already proven that there are many different ways we can, we can learn a word. And actually they think it's sequential. It's sequential. You, you will learn certain things about a word. Uh, it's like if you've ever had a feeling like when you read something, you think, okay, I can, I can guess the meaning, and you just keep going. Because in that situation, it doesn't hinder or hurt your comprehension. Um, so that's where it's easy for you to keep going. And actually, um, you mentioned, I forgot, did you mean, who mentioned about directly connecting the vocabulary word to the second, to the first language to the second language? Johnny, was it you? Yeah, so. It says that actually uh, the words that are in the very beginning, the first few hundred vocabulary words, this will happen. And then later your your ability will be too too good to to waste this processing power. You will just uh, connect it to other things within the second language. Okay, so there is a, a default argument, and this is a theory because why is there? Why is this theory, the default argument, like available? Because they cannot come up with any better theory. They only know that the researchers have only proved, like, for, with first language learners, that uh, when students in America are in high school, they know between twenty-five thousand and fifty thousand words. So, does somebody teach them every single word? No, it's impossible. So how do they get, how do they know all of these words? So uh, they just say, the researchers have just said, oh, it has to be just through um, incidental inter, you know, interaction. Maybe they're uh, reading a lot. You read a lot at school. A majority of the things you read is at school at this time. Or you interact with your peers or you watch TV. So that's the default argument because they can they cannot figure out any other reason why. Even they've run different kinds of experiments, but they cannot pinpoint where all of the learning is taking place. But there have been some people against the uh, the default argument, and they said that, um, like I said before, Krashen and some others have said, oh, you can learn everything you need from context by just reading. You can learn all the vocabulary you need in the second language just by reading. But others, such as Cobb and some of these other researchers I've listed, they've said that, well, um, yeah, extensive reading can help, but you should do more than just that. Because in the second language uh, situation, as I mentioned before, in, foreign language, uh, in, in a foreign language environment, there's you don't have the peers to interact with that are speaking in English, you don't have as much TV, and you don't have to be in this environment, in the English environment, if you don't, if you don't want to. And also, there has been um, use with the internet. Also, why do you have to let? Um, why does it have to be that students just can learn incidentally when, when you're in a second language environment where you don't have a lot of input? that you can't use the internet or other resources to improve your vocabulary. So these are arguments against um, just using purely incidental learning. So, but I have to say that the people before that have said that you cannot, that you should learn everything incidentally, like Krashen, the reason you are saying is that your, your language, that you, your language will be acquired in a more native-like way. It's saying that in the other way, you will reach 
you can go farther. But at least they're trying to say that this way, if you keep always intentionally learning, you're never going to reach a native-like ability. You will fossilize. Mm -hmm. Teacher, I have a better example. <laughs> okay, thank yes. you. The school children uh, play video games, mm -hmm. like Sangboy and Yi, and uh, they pick up Japanese vocabulary. Oh, yeah, it's true. Yes. I heard about this uh, mm -hmm. phenomenon in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good example, thank you. Uh, so they don't intend to learn the vocabulary. They no, but they need to navigate in the game. Yeah. That's why, like I asked my uh, friend before, has a Wii, and a lot of the games are Japanese. And I just, mm -hmm. So, how do you? Play the game. He said, "Oh, we've been doing this since we were kids. We know. Maybe we don't know how to pronounce, but we know what the meaning is because it's just another fu hao, you know, just a simple. Yeah. Okay. So, um, can reading link learn a link to vocabulary acquisition? So, now back to reading a lot. So some some um, uh, researchers have said that." Um, they talk about word families. It's like, for example, the word, um, um, let's see, eat, ate, eaten. Mm -hmm. This would be considered all the same word family. So they say that unsimplified texts are uh, that you need to acquire enough. We need to get second language learners so they can um, read unsimplified texts. And what I mean by unsimplified text, it hasn't been made easy. It's just whatever you get, whatever somebody else has wrote, a native speaker or not native speaker, it doesn't matter. But it hasn't been altered. Because when you get an English textbook, sometimes it's made easier or they put certain grammar inside this kind of thing. But, and a lot of people are using something called graded readers. You know, they're very small, condensed novels that you can, that you can buy uh, in, and it will, it will say on the back, be low beginner or beginner. And it's all the same novel, but they're using different amounts of vocabulary. Mm -hmm. And these are called graded readers. And research has shown that most graded readers, they fall short of the 3,000 word, word families. And uh, so what happens is if you try to use graded readers to improve your your vocabulary ability, like a lot of second language um, learners, they use these graded readers, especially like in high school. They use them a lot in Taiwan too. Um, you cannot get students past 2,000 uh, word families. And But what Cobb has found out is that if you look at unsimplified fiction, like novels that haven't been altered, uh, you need about 3,000 word families. So right now, if you use graded readers to learn English, you have a large gap. And other researchers have found out if there, when, when a, when a non-native speaker reads a text, and if there are too many unknown vocabulary, too many unknown vocabulary inside the text, they cannot comprehend it. They will give up. But right now, a lot of foreign, in foreign language situations, they're using these these readers, but the readers are inadequate because they cannot help them to bridge the gap to, to, to regular fiction. If they can bridge the gap to regular fiction, then students then don't need the graded readers anymore and they can read uh, the nonfiction, like for example, like Harry Potter, this kind of level, and then they could go on to more difficult things like research papers and this kind of thing. So right now there's a, a big, like, Second language learners are making a gigantic leap. And actually, these, um, these graded readers are also used by native speakers as well. When I was a kid, I read a lot of graded readers, too. And then some other research has shown, though, that even, um, yeah, like I said, even if you took out all proper nouns and everything, you have, if you have a 2,000 level word family knowledge, you won't be able to read. Um, you won't be able to read uh, not uh, unsimplified fiction without. You won't be able to enjoy it. It won't be pleasurable because it will become what it will become a, 
instead of uh, it will become very intentional because you will need to look up too many vocabulary or you will just give up. So like I said, there needs to be a balance. But there are some other researchers, they said uh, it's okay. Uh, now with the internet, it's very easy to, to um, manipulate text. So we can take uh, we can take text and do other things. We can use different online tools, maybe to assist students in in tackling these um, these more difficult uh, fiction texts and things like that. But still, in the end, even if they get to the, the to being able to read unsimplified fiction, um, second language learners still need five thousand base words. So here it doesn't mean the word families. They need about 5,000 words to be able to read, get the main points of non-subject specific text. The main points. That means if you read, it's not reading articles. It's some general, general text. Not, there are no like um, jargon, no jargon from certain um, fields. Do you have the list of the 5,000 base words? Uh, no, but I I can I can look for it. There's a there's a lot of this kind of list thing that's available, but a lot of people don't like the list because a lot of the lists are just the most frequently occurring words. Yeah. But in the uh, Emory Joint book. Yeah, I know they have a list. That's like six thousand base words, and I just kind of. I've looked at the list before, but sometimes it's kind of. Uh, if you look at those kind of lists, sometimes the words seem, oh, this seems like a word you need to know, but sometimes it's like, do students really need to know this word? And why waste the time to teach students that word when they can just pick it up? Uh -huh. yeah. So I'm against lists. So there's also been some researchers that said, oh, it's better than if you go with reading plus uh, something else. So some, have, some researchers have spoken about the richness of how vocabulary is encoded, meaning that you need to process it more, do more things with it, not just look at the word. But the more you do with it, the more things you say, you review it, you, you write it down, you put it in a sentence, you draw a picture, you talk to someone, you put it in a story, then you do the exercises. The more and more you do, it's kind of like, it's, it's very close to becoming uh, drill and practice. Very, very close, but not, not yet. And this is a lot, but I'm just going to state it briefly. Uh, this researcher in the 70s came up with a theory um, of trace, um, theory of trace systems in her memory. And her research um, basically involved uh, children learning a second language. And she would read storybooks to them. And she would make them talk a lot about the vocabulary word that they encountered. What does this word make you think of? Does it make you think of another word in your first language? Look at the picture. Do you think that anything in the picture is this word that you've just found? In order to try to get um, the student to make more connections or more traces in their brain, because she believes, she came up with a theory that um, actually every time you encounter a new vocabulary in your second language, only one time, it's already in your brain. You just cannot access it. But if you make more routes, more roads mm -hmm. to get to the vocabulary, then if one road is closed because of a, like a roadblock, you can take another road. You can take the detour to get there. That was her theory. So that, those are all the theories that actually that I've uh, found on um, incidental vocabulary acquisition. As I said, right now, there is no good theory that's available. They just use a default theory stating that, researchers just use a default theory stating that, oh, because we cannot come up with any other uh, reason, therefore, everybody must get all of this vocabulary from reading. Because in first language it happens, in second language it happens too. Because we cannot say that 
every single word that we know in our second language, somebody taught us that word. If, if we can say that, that means our, our vocabulary is very limited. Right? I, can anybody here say every word that I know in English, somebody taught me this word? No, it's, it's impossible. Okay, so because of this, um, because of all of this interest though, in first language, it started, it started um, interest in second language because they had all of the research about first language incidental vocabulary acquisition. So they thought, oh, I think we, can, we, we haven't explored it in second language. And this happens a lot in language studies. A lot has happened in first language and then it will go to second language. They'll say, oh, we didn't do it. Let's explore and, and see uh, what happens. Um, but before I talk about the different um, research studies, um, I want to re, uh, redefine what I said before about incidental and intentional learning. Because the way that the research uses uh, incidental and intentional, these two vocabulary words, is operationalized differently. It has a different meaning, okay? Here, intentional learning just means when we finish the task, you will have a test. Incidental learning means I want you to finish, I, either it means when you, after you finish the task, you're going to have something else to do, but instead of giving them something else to do, you give them a test. Or you just say, oh, I just want you to read this and give me your feelings. But then after it's over, you get a test. So do you see the difference? Intentional is, here, read this, and you want to have a test. Incidental is, here, read this. Surprise, you have a test. <laughs> OK? So that's the only difference in these studies. So I um, I categorize the studies. So if the, each, uh, if the teacher you know, run this, uh, yes. surprise, you're going to have a test, yes. then they will become intentional because the student know what the teacher going to do. Only the test will be intentional, right. Uh -huh. They will try to score well. Yeah. But when they were reading, they were not reading to try to learn new vocabulary words. But, I mean, it, it happens several times. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But if it happens several times to the students, um, in this situation, students will know when they read to, yeah. I better pay attention to this. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. It, will, it will become an intentional, so you have to control for this. Mm -hmm. But usually, it was like in a setting where this didn't happen. The, the, <laughs> because like, for example, when I was in elementary school, mm -hmm. when we didn't have, when we finished our homework, the teacher would always make us to go to, um, we, she had a box of these cards with stories mm -hmm. and uh, in questions, and we always had to go and read. But the teacher never graded the, she would give us a, a point if we did it, but it didn't mean anything. It's just like, oh, you can earn some toys or something. You, you it's nothing, it, it didn't count off on your grade or anything like that. So I've categorized the studies into two different groups. This is the differences in vocabulary games. So you can look quickly at the green numbers. All of these studies uh, were, similar in some way, which was that they were testing incidental, incidental vocabulary acquisition through reading, through reading. So they were giving students something to read and then not telling them they're going to have a test and then later testing them on the vocabulary that appeared within the reading. And as you can see, these are just percentages, but all of the percentages are different. Uh, because there are a lot of variables that you have to control for. As you can notice, the paper of Webbs that we read, many, many variables he tried to control for because in previous studies, no one, it was always a new variable each time. So now I want to review some of, some of the studies. So the first set of studies involved a novel called A Clockwork Orange. And, um, so A Clockwork Orange is a very special novel because this novel includes something called NADSAT words. And these NADSAT words are just made up words 
they are made up words. So when the author wrote the novel, he included a lot of made up words in the novel because it was like a slang language that the people in the novel used amongst themselves. So he made up these slang languages. And here's like an excerpt, and I tried to highlight all of the words that are Nanzat words. So like for the first sentence, our pockets were full of dung. So dung is not a real word, it's a Nanzat word. So there was no real need from the point of view of crasting. Crasting is also a Nanzat word. Anyone, pretty poly. Any more pretty poly. Pretty poly is also a Nanzat word. To talk chop is also a Nanzat word. Some old beck. Beck is a Nanzat word. In an alley and V. That's also an ad set word. So you can see all of these made up words appear all throughout the novel. So this is a very good resource for teachers. Why? No need for pretense. Mm -hmm. No need for pretense. Because it's guaranteed 100% the students are not going to know the words mm -hmm. because they're made up. So the very first study that started the whole the whole thing was uh, was this study in 1978, and they mentioned that all oh, learners need learners need to know 3,600 word forms. During that time, that's what they were saying. But you know, many researchers have different opinions. It all, and they said, but this excludes polysemous words, words that have more than one meaning. They don't include this kind of thing. Um, and also, um, they said the amount of common vocabulary knowledge decreases as words level increases. And uh, they tried to say also, oh, we think that vocabulary teaching material must be individualized. I also agree with this study, too. Even though this study is a very simple study, I think it's a, it's a very it's a very good study because I also think that, for example, for for most second language learners, they're using the second language as a tool. Only they don't need to know such a variety of vocabulary. They need to only know certain um, vocabulary for a certain field. Okay. So also they talked about indirect and direct. That's kind of um, as we were talking about before. Incidental, incidental learning, this kind of thing. They just use different vocabulary. So what happened in their, in their study was they didn't need the pretest because they have a clockwork orange. And this novel contained 241 of these NADSAT words. And they occurred on average 15 times each, but uh, some words only occurred once, and some words would occur 209 times within the novel. Uh, so what they did is they randomly chose 90 words from the novel. Some of them were high frequency, and they defined high frequency as 18 times or more, and some were low frequency, 17 times or, or less. And they got 20 English native speakers. So you see, this is a second language study, but they use native speakers as their subjects. Um, and these native speakers were in Indonesia uh, for some kind of educational purposes. And they were given cardboard orange and told them, here, read the novel on your own. Uh, when you finish the novel, we want you to write a, a critique, like a book report. Like in, in America, often when we're in elementary school, the teacher will sign us books and ask us to write book reports, like a summary and then our reflection of the book. And so that's what they were asked to do. But actually, uh, instead, they were given a vocabulary test, multiple choice vocabulary test. So when they did read the statistics, it said that the minimum number of repetitions should be 10, um, at least 10 times. But their results were very complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason their results were complicated is sometimes there would be a vocabulary that was only shown one time, 100% of the students learned the vocabulary. Other times there would be a vocabulary, it was in there 50, 60, 70 times, nobody learned the word. <laughs> Why? What's going on? So they just said, oh, 
uh, context. And they say, oh, maybe the, the, the ones that only happen one time, the word is too similar to an English word. Or it's too, so they were able to guess too easily. Yes. But actually, it was not, it was not. Are you still having a problem? You okay? Okay. So, um, um, so that made it more interesting to the students and also they, they, um, they feel, like I said before, they filled in the, all of the gaps in the close passage. Um, and they gave them 30 minutes to read and they chose 17 target words. And they determined through a pilot study that the students uh, didn't know these vocabulary words. Because originally they had 27, but the students knew that the other ones, so um, they, they took those out. So the test was also a multiple choice test. Um, but this time there was, in their multiple choice uh, answers, they allowed for I don't know as one of the options. And um, also every time that uh, they told them not to guess and told them to write, I don't know if you really didn't know. But there was a, a significant difference, but they didn't expect that probably that the students would really uh, know these words after a long period of time. So they suggested that future research should do a delayed post case for these and for this type of study. And maybe if they could do some kind of longitudinal research, it would be better. Skipping some because I think they, they're, too, they're very similar. So in this one, um, they ask some different types of questions like, "Oh, it's been it's been proven for first language. It's been proven for English. Let's try French <laughs> and publish a paper." And um, how efficient? So they had three classes of university French language students in the U.S and uh, two intermediate French classes. And so we had an experimental group and a control group. And also another control group was an advanced French class. So what they did is on day one of the class, they did the first five scenes of a film. It's a French film without subtitles. And um, eight out of the later 10 tested vocabulary words were spoken in the film. And then day two, they gave them a typed handout of the next five scenes to read. And they only gave them 40 minutes to read. And then they were told, though, you will have our comprehension text. And but 30 percent of the students could not finish the reading. And um, so both the controls and the experimental group took the same test, but remember the control in my senior field. And what is the result? So controls both scored poorly on the test. Um, and experimental groups scored significantly higher. But I think a lot of these studies is very obvious why. Because if you give the input and you're going to score higher. If I test if I give this talk today and I gave you guys a quiz and I go outside and I get 10 people from the street and I give them the quiz. <laughs> you would do better, right? right. If you don't, you're, you're asleep or something. <laughs> yeah, there's something else at work. But uh, they said the students did gain an average of six words. And they said, oh, we think they would have done better if they just had more time to finish. But you know, the reason they didn't have time to finish is because the class was over, I guess. Mm -hmm. And they said, um, Again, delayed post testing is needed. Uh, and also that he just said, oh, but still, reading is far more pleasant than direct vocabulary instruction. Because it's so uh, crashing. Uh, but they don't mention anything about frequency of meaning, those kind of things. Okay, in this study, then they they critique, critique all of the past uh, research, and they said, oh, uh, in the past research, they're not reading a whole novel or a whole 
story, a whole scene, a whole movie, or whatever. They're not doing the whole thing. And they said they're overestimating the vocabulary that have been learned. The real, because they're, they, sometimes it didn't include real words. And for, that's for real words. And for net stacks, they said, oh, this shows just a limited demonstration of, of learning all these because we don't know how many frequencies they need to really, we, could, we don't get a real number. We don't have any number here. And also, it, it just seems like they're just saying the same thing over and over again. Yeah, you can acquire some vocabulary, but how much, really? And can I apply this to all students? So they thought they could do better, but I don't think so. And they got 34 low intermediate students, and they read, the teacher read aloud the 21,232 word text of a reader. It took 16 hours total for the students to listen to the teacher reading. But they said, oh, we wanted, we, the te we wanted the teacher to read to make sure the students learn, uh, read every single word. But I don't know if you guys have ever tried it, but when, if you get an audio book in, in English and you listen and you read, well, you will feel you can really read fast because it's, you're, you're getting in, too input at the same time. Yeah, but they don't, they ignore this. And there were pictures in the book. And, but they weren't allowed to use the dictionary and they were not allowed to take the books home. And then they were given a test before to make sure that they knew the 2,000 most frequent uh, word labels and they scored, this is what they scored, so it should be the, the, the book that they were, that they listened to should have been okay for them. It should have been at their level. Um, so they, they excluded all high frequency words and proper nouns because they assumed that students already knew those vocabulary. But there were 222 base words that remained and then they got rid of all of the words that only happened once because they assumed one time is not enough. And then there were 75 words left and eight of them occurred more than seven times and those along with 37 others were randomly chosen to yield a total of 45 words. I don't know why they chose 45, it's just their, their choice. And they had a pretest. So a week before reading, uh, they were given a 45 item multiple choice test and a 13 item word association pretest. So almost half the words were already known by the students uh, out of the 45 words. So they they got rid of those two. So in their post test, they found out there was a gain of 4.65 words on the multiple choice test and 4.28 on word association. So they say it's a 16% increase. Um, they tried to say that they thought that maybe eight or more times would, would be better, but Less than eight is hard to predict. So I think they set out to try to do a better study, but um, they didn't really, they really weren't successful because even though they control for more variables, they still, they still the way they conducted their research caused more intervening variables to, to manifest. So um, I have one more lengthy study to talk about and then I think I have to take a break. <laughs> so this study I think is a quite a good study um, that they wanted to know, they, they, they also criticized the past research because they said, yeah we know that learners are learning some vocabulary from reading, um, but their gain scores are barely registered as significant. So it's significant, but just barely. So could this be because of the tests? They're able to read and then look at the, at the vocabulary and guess the correct answer. And often they said, sometimes the, the texts are very short and difficult. When we really read something for fun, we will read a story we enjoy, not because it's very difficult. We want to read because we enjoy to read, read a novel, not because, and not like try to suffer through it. And 
there is no data showing the post tests. And they don't know how deep they know this word. They only know they're defining that students know a word by they're able to answer it correctly on a multiple choice tests. So also they talked about, oh, they did some bad, the way they conducted their, their experiment was not good. You know, um, playing videos or reading it to students or, you know, this kind of thing. Um, and still nobody is giving the number. And they say, oh, we want to determine the frequency of occurrence, but they don't give any any information, really. They just make up, maybe eight is enough, maybe 10 is enough, but they don't give a real number. So here's the research questions that the researchers came up with. Is how many new words are learned from reading a graded reader and retained over time? So they, they made it very specific, like they, the graded readers I talked to you about that, that many students use to, to improve their English. And not only can they pick up some vocabulary, but if we wait and give a post-test, are they able to still retain those vocabulary? Um, and are the words that are more frequently in, in a text able to be learned um, better than the ones that appear less frequency? And what rate are the words forgotten? And how about different tests? Let's try other types of tests and see what kind of results we get. So they chose a graded reader called A Little Princess. And they chose 25 words from different frequencies. And they had three types of tests and three test periods. And the participants were 15 lower intermediate level or above, 19 to 21 year old Japanese females. And they're all, 12 of them were English excuse me, English majors? There were 12 English majors, sorry. They're all English majors. And half of them were from the English club on campus. So that means they were highly motivated in English, learning English. So they said, but how do we present students with a text that, in which is 96 and 99 percent coverage is of known words? Remember in the, in the very beginning of the talk, I told about word families and this kind of thing, some research. So they're saying, oh, the past research has shown that if students don't know enough of the words they're reading, any new words they encounter, they won't be able to learn them. So we want to make sure that it's very easy for the students to read. So they said, oh, that's very easy. Um, we can do a pretest, but a pretest will highlight the words. So they said, oh, maybe we can do it. We can come up with another solution. Choose a text that is very easy for the students, way, way below their, their level. So we know that every word inside of the, the book they read, they're going to know all the words. Um, so that's what they did. And they chose uh, a little princess. No, what is the pet words? Um, the pet words. Pet words. Well, we pet words. I think pet, I, let's see. I think here it just means like the low number of, like for example, when you, have um, a graded reader, like a beginning level, it will say you need to know so many words like, oh, to read this book, you need to know uh, zero to 200 words. To read another book, you need to know 200 to 500. Mm -hmm. If you look on the back of a lot of them, they will list how many yes. numbers of words. So that's what it's talking about. So it was the, the lowest number, uh, four, 400. Um, they chose one far below, so I'm not for sure what is a, a what level a little princess, but I'm guessing it will be zero to two hundred. Yeah. Can I use another vocabulary like target words? Uh, I don't know if the they will say, they will say it's target words because. It could, it, it could be if the point of, of them to read is to really acquire the, the vocabulary. So that means that every book in that label, it would include only those 400 words or 200 words. Um, so they thought, well, we could use synonyms instead of the original words. But they thought that would be a problem because maybe the students already know the synonyms. So OK, we need to use substitute words and change the spellings. So I think this is very similar to the paper we read in class. Um, 
this researcher says it's not nonsense words, but they are nonsense words. I don't understand his definition of not being nonsense words. Um, but they have tested to make sure that these words, like the, the uh, students with at this label, they thought these were real words in English. They just thought, oh, I haven't learned them. Mm -hmm. Because the way they spelled the words, it looked like it followed English spelling. You know, yeah. pre, uh, prefix, suffix, and root words, they just mushed them together to make new words, but those were not real words. But they could be real words. Yeah. They could be real words. Real words. Um, very, very rare yeah. words. Yeah, they just made it up. Actually, yeah. we call it pseudo words. Yeah, pseudo words is also. Um, and then they said, well, how many should we choose? And they said, oh, if we choose 25, we can give reasonable, reliable data, and select different frequencies, so from very low to very high, and they chose nouns and adjectives because they wanted those to be, they thought those would be easier to guess than ad, uh, adverbs. The reason was they wanted to see not just that you totally knew the vocabulary, but they had different measures, so they wanted to know if there was, if they, the, the learners knew the words in any way at all. So they took the words and put them in five groups. Five words that occurred once, five words that occurred four to five times, just et cetera. And they didn't include a test group uh, of 20, 21 to 31 in order to make sure that the coverage of known words was 96.2% because uh, some researchers have said you need 90, 96%, some said have, have said 98% that all the words you need to know within the text uh, before, uh, not to make the person reading the text feel uh, frustrated because they're encountering too many unknown words to keep up. Um, and they just assume that all oh, they should, they're English majors and it's such a low level, they should know these words already. And then um, they piloted the test with eight other students of similar ability and make sure that all of, the, all of their tests was, would be reliable. And these are the different kinds of tests they had. They had a word form recognition. They just had the, the, the words and said circle one that is a real word. And they had some distractors too. And also multiple choice, they had different kinds of, the multiple choice would have four choices. The correct one, three distractors, and one that said I don't know. And the distractors are written in a certain way to see if they, like for example, they mistook a word for an, an adjective when it was a noun or this kind of thing. You see more than just do they know the meaning. And also translation. Just what, what do these words mean? Write the meaning in Japanese. And here is the order. They did the recognition first, the trans translation, and then the multiple choice because they didn't want the, there to be any kind of effect on the, if you do the multiple choice, you may get some idea and be better able to translate. Okay, so they just gave them the, the book, told them to read and enjoy it, and didn't tell them about the test. And after they read, they said, here's the test. And they also recorded the time of how long it took for the students to finish reading. And they asked them at the end, do you think it was easy to read, a little difficult, or very difficult? And then some students kept saying, oh, there are a lot of unknown words. And then they just would say, okay, please enjoy it. <laughs> That's the only thing they would say. So then seven to 10 days later, the students took the same test again, unannounced. <laughs> and then three months later, they took the test again, also unannounced. Um, and always the test items, like, if the first time this uh, item number one occurred first, then maybe it would be somewhere else in the test the next time. It would all be mixed up. So the results, uh, they learned some words, but most of them they didn't learn. Uh, as time passed, students forgot more and more words. On average, students learned one new word from one hour of reading, up to three months later. So on average, students could learn one one word from one hour after three months later. Um, 
and they're able to learn the words from context, but they're able, they're more successful if it if the frequency is higher. And also, they said the results regarding the rate of words forgotten depends on the method of testing. So, if they look at vocabulary, I mean, sorry, if they look at multiple choice, of course, students will do better than translation. Okay. Um, that, that's recognition test. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the, and like the recognition was the, would be the highest, just circling. Yeah. Um, so they said, oh, the data seems to suggest that there is some kind of critical threshold of a number, but they don't know what it is. And they also said, oh, what does it mean to learn a new word? So they said, hmm. They said, recognition of the meaning when prompted on a multiple choice test is not considered learning a new word. The reason they say this is because um, they're not able to do it well on the translation. Um, so they said maybe multiple choice tests may be better as a learning activity, like flashcards or something in the classroom, maybe that's better. And, and they also show, see for example, that the multiple choice test scores were over two times higher than those of the mini test, like the translation. So you was, if you give students the same, the same words uh, and ask them to do multiple choice, then do translation, they're going to perform 230% times better on the multiple choice. And it says, to have a 50% chance to recognize a word three months later, they need to read that word at least eight times. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's eight times. Um, but for just um, writing the word, uh, writing the, uh, sorry, to translate the word, uh, even if they met the word 18 times, they only have a 10 to 15 percent chance that they will be able to remember the word. If they've read for one hour, and inside what the inside the text they've read, a word, a new word occurs 18 times. Three months later, if they're given a translation test, only 10 to 15 percent chance they will be able to translate the word. Um, so they said, oh, even if you know 90%, 96% of the words in, a, in some piece of text, even if you know that much and you encounter some words, it's, maybe it's not, you're not going to learn those 4% very well. Why? They said, because the learners were focused on enjoying the text. They were not, their attention was not on learning new vocabulary said the words were not made explicit and there's another researcher that says oh you have to have explicit teaching you have to somehow show the students that these words are important when you read an English textbook and there's an article the target words are what old right sometimes there's footnotes or something else so they're saying well we think it would be they, they made a prediction that it would be you need more 20 or 30 times uh, to really be able to learn the word and maybe not forget it because think about after three months Maybe they only have one they only got one word and it was 18 times So it says maybe it's better if learners read they need to read several hundred or seven thousand words in order to learn one new word There's a lot of reading in order to learn one new word and they said also Maybe they had a flaw in their study because the students may have found that learning substitutes words were even more difficult because they may already have known the English word. Mm -hmm. So they may have been reading the word and said, this seems like the word look. What other word could there be like look that I don't know? It's such an easy word. Well, I don't know this word. The rest of the words are so easy. And also there may be individual, so they, they, they looked at individual variation. They wanted to re-examine their data. They wanted some result, actually. So they said, they timed the students. They wanted to see if there was a difference between fast and slow readers. Um, so they scored the same. Um, the, see, they're very similar on multiple choice, but on the translation, the faster readers scored a little bit better. 
but the others is you know very similar. Uh, so they think that the speed of reading, how fast you read, whether you read fast or slow, it doesn't have much effect. And and they said, oh, but we think the better students in the class scored a little bit, a little bit better. In the interview, they just said that the students that thought that the novel was difficult, they scored low on the test. And the students that said the novel was easy, they scored high on the test. So um, they looked at their data again. So they found out, oh, we found out that several of the words were easy to learn and remember. Here's the example. Jerks was one of the words but it was a substitute for the word years. So, and it has a strong collocation, strong collocation with numbers. So there would always be uh, digits, you know, maybe like 19, what was the made of word? Jerks. So this may have been acting as a signifier, some kind of make them notice this word. Um, so it's the highest rated word on, on all three tests, on all the tests. And another example was molden dead. And so these two words accounted for 65% of all correct responses. And also ute, which stood for yes, accounts for approximately 58 of the total score for the translation. So they said some words are easier to learn than others, or the experimental data have been, may have been compromised. So I think that their data was compromised. Mm -hmm. So they reanalyzed their data again. So they took out jerks and, and use, so years and yes. And they, the learning rate and the meaning of translation is cut in less than half. So before, remember, there was, after three months, you had one word. So now, you, after three months, you have half of a word. So that suggests that they're even lower, lower rates, and also incorrect guessing. Some words may have been confused, they said, with the real English equivalents. Like, they thought that some students, when they looked at the translation data, when students saw the word window, they translated the Japanese word for wind. And when they saw uh, branch, they translated the Japanese word for branch. Uh, yes, and when they saw big, they translated, because you know Japanese has some problem with pronunciation <laughs> of English. So when they heard grit, grit, they think it's, they look at it, and they pronounced it in their mind, they pronounce big, because in Japanese, when, they, when Japanese pronounce big, it sounds like brick, or something similar. And also there are some words, like tense, which is a Japanese word that sounds like tensu. So what they, and sometimes you know there are a lot of Japanese that is borrowed from English. So they just wrote out the word and think, oh, maybe that's an English word because in Japanese we have this word, you know. So a lot of incorrect guessing. So there's a lot of limitations. So they said, oh, we have a lot of limitations that we have few subjects, not enough words, and we we shouldn't have selected such easy words that of course students will know, like yes and here. And so they said, here are our conclusions. We think that the words can be learned incidentally from context, but few new words appear. And half of the words that students learn will be immediately forgotten. And don't use multiple only multiple choice tests for your data because Obviously, it's not a good indicator that students know the full understanding of, they don't have a full understanding of the word. And uh, it only looks at the learning of new words. Because you know, sometimes we encounter a word more than once. Mm -hmm. So how could we test for this kind of uh, phenomenon? And um, also at the very end, which I think this is a very good paragraph here, they mentioned, oh, there are a lot of things we should consider collocations uh, and patterns within the text, and also students' ability to chunk. This is where this is where I'm headed in my in my research because I think this is this is the heart of the problem. 
so they just waste a lot of time with all of the past research and they try so hard.所以接下来就是Barry, you will be the teacher. Oh,那我去介绍给我自己的老师,希望他当学,因为这对全所对视频都是好事。然后第二件事情就是关于你们接下来的报告,以及你们的final,就是我觉得第一堂课只有一个要求,就是你要成为你那个领域的expert, 那我们听得懂你在讲你的那个领域是什么东西啊，就像Barry今天告诉我们这个呃vocabulary的acquisition这样子，incidental的。所以呃今天到Barry为止，大概每个人都报告完了。你大概也知道你那天报告的是不是算
differences in the results. We have a lot of differences in how much vocabulary students gain and also whatever the researcher believes is the, the correct number or some kind of threshold that uh, vocabulary needs to appear within a text before um, a learner can acquire their vocabulary. But uh, a lot of past, a lot of studies have critiqued um, the way in which previous studies have been conducted. And maybe they say, oh, maybe that is why that there's a difference in the results. And some say it's because the multiple choice tests, they don't show a true uh, representation of what students have learned. Also, some say it's not, vocabulary learning is not a linear process because sometimes we learn a vocabulary and then we forget it and then we learn it again. So it's kind of a cycle. Um, also, Preston has mentioned things such as learning or acquiring. Uh, also, there's got to be enough delayed post-testing. Some researchers are asked, what, is, what does it mean to learn vocabulary? And also, some have mentioned, oh, it has, there's a lot of variables such as the English ability of the learners that hasn't been taken into consideration. So there has been a lot of different um, critiques in the past, but um, now I'm going to go to my final thoughts and, and conclusions about a little bit about what I kind of feel is the main problem with all of these studies, which I kind of touched upon at the very beginning of the presentation about context. So I have some questions now I'm asking that I will use to reevaluate all of the all the research that I've found on incidental vocabulary acquisition to try to figure out why they cannot come up with the number. They want to find this number, but they're unable to find this number, and why there has been such a big difference in the amount of vocabulary that have been gained by these students. And I think that the researchers have lost the original focus. If you remember, in the very first study that I mentioned, um, where it, with the Clockwork Orange st uh, study, students were given a novel to read, and they just said, go read the novel, and they just took it with them, and some read it in one time, sitting down, and read the whole novel, and some read it across uh, three days, or however long it was, just like somebody does something for fun, and then they were tested on the vocabulary, and they learned some vocabulary. But as you can tell in the progression, it's getting less and less like reading. Do you think that what, in the, in the paper we read in the class, is that really what, are they really reading? Is that considered, do you think it's reading? No, what, we, what the studies have started to do now, they're just testing how well students can take a test. They're not testing how well they acquire vocabulary because they are trying to, what? You know, reading a text, reading is already very, wild and it's just out there and when you have a text and you manipulate it so much that it becomes not realistic anymore it's too artificial and that's what's happened because for example the paper we read there are too many variables he controlled for he controlled too well till it becomes not reading anymore right there are too many variables and also that's why I think counting the frequencies is very arbitrary. It doesn't make any sense because, why? Because just like in the beginning we discussed how context will affect the meaning the surrounding. We cannot just look at a single word, but we have to look at what surrounds the word. And there's no theory. I think it's, I think it is um, unfair to just say, we cannot think of any reason why this thing happens, so that's our theory. We don't we haven't thought of anything else better to to call it, so let's just call it this because we don't know. That's not the point of research. Research is to try to discover why and, and try to build a theory. So I think researchers need to focus more on building a theory. And I think they have an oversimplification of the definition of word. They just think word is some letters put together, separated by a white space. Do you understand what I'm saying? They think that just a group of letters 
and there's some Y in between. That's a word. That's what they think is a word. All of them? Huh? All of them. Or the paper you calculated in this? All the papers on incidental vocabulary acquisition. I've read uh, over 20 papers. I, I think why we can find those kind of phenomena is because the experiment, experiment research all have those kind of problems. We test our subject in unnormal situation. All of our experimental research will do that. Why we do that? Because we want to control some confounding factors. Yeah, so why not have a and, uh, quasi experimental design? If we involve in the natural situation, how people learn words or learn anything. Another problem is you can't make the codes clearly. Too many factors could affect your conclusion. Yeah, but you cannot, if, that, if that's true, that's fine, but you cannot ignore those factors. And uh, the problem right. would be you get, a, that you get a group of data, and uh, there's too many factors in your research, and uh, you can't say why you can get those no, I disagree with you because there would be no theories if we didn't, there would be no theories related to first and second language acquisition if we just said we had to isolate them. Do you get what I'm saying? I know. And Language the, is impossible to, to I, do, I, I to mean, do like this. We're not mixing two chemicals together. There are things happening in our brain so we can control for something, but you can, you have to have some balance. I know the the really learning cannot isolate with another. Uh, what the, what are the meaning? The true meaning of learning is we can learn something independently. We learn something because we can find what we learn and the relationship with other things. For example, we learn a word because we know other words that can connect with the new word we are learning. We we learn right now. So you you mentioned we can calculate learning. Just maybe no, no, no. the I think, physical. I think we're saying very similar things. Here is my problem with this research. This re these research studies say they are they are doing one thing, but when in fact they're doing something else. It's okay to say it's okay to do this kind of research, but you have to be clear on what you are doing, and you have to say what you're doing. Not say you you don't say. I'm doing A, but when in fact you're doing something totally different. That is the problem in the research. So the key point you want to say is and, their and, and explanation, to explanation is to exceed what they are doing? No, they don't explain what, they, they say they're testing incidental vocabulary acquisition, but they're not. I don't think they are not. They are just to crowd, they narrow the point. They, what they are doing can explain the the situation and uh, the situation or the learning phenomena, but they are but all of their results, actually all of their results are not consistent. If they have the same experiment and they use the same variables and the same controls in the same situation, the result will be different. In other studies such as this, we control the variables and we do replication studies. We do the same experiment over, we get the same result, and therefore we can conclude that what we did, we can make some observations and say, okay, this is the way it is. But when you have the same study and you do it twice, and then the result is different, there's some problem. But the problem, they, can, it's there is too the many is, cues can, can cause the Problem. The problem is they're not really looking at the way language behaves. Language, you cannot isolate the vocabulary like this because language doesn't behave in this way. Yes, I, I agree with your point. And I think all of the research, if you use the, if you use the methodologies depend on experimental research. You, can, you always can tell those kind of 
those those kind of argument. But actually, there there is there is a stay tuned to be continued. The next time I talk, then I will tell you about the ways that they can do a more realistic study for incidental so acquisition. So those kind of research would not use experimental methods, right? They can. They can, but they right? need to use, they uh, can, they, they can. can, they can, but they haven't, because it's hard. So I think the problem will be methodology. Yeah, so we're saying similar same thing. things. I'm not saying that you cannot do, you cannot use an experimental design to, to test. I'm just saying they need to come up with a better experiment design. Uh, uh, I, I want to explain is why they chose experimental method is because they want to get a clean I conclusion. That. Yeah, I agree. but the, the problem was just like you say. But that kind of situation is not the really learning situation that the learner will involve in the real life. But you know, I think that you can get close. And you can use other data to try to supplement it, not just ignore it. Mm -hmm. Do you get what I'm saying? You, yes. You can use... What, uh, what kind of you method use, would be take the both advantage? You can see how people interact with the text. You can use eye tracking. You can use um, computer software to analyze text. You can see how, how learners chunk a text how they take notes, there's a lot of different things you can do that isn't being explored yet. So they are natural and they are still experimental research? Sure, you can look, you can use different kinds of data, log data, and you can still use tests and those kind of things. But what I'm saying, I think that those kind of things need to complement qualitative uh, data as well. But the research you mentioned that use uh, the way that can combine the experimental research method and uh, the and the real learning situation. Why they are not show up in your presentation today? I'm sorry, can you ask um, the question again? Sorry, I mean we talk about is those kind of research you you introduced to us mm -hmm. is focused on experimental method, experimental yes. method, and yes. they they narrow the situation. Learner can learn in English, mm -hmm. therefore they get some result, but that cannot project to the real learning yes. situation, right? Yes. But you tell me right now. Actually, there is some method. They still experimental research, and they can take care the real situation that learning learner really involved in their mm -hmm. real yes. learning process. Yes. Why? So those kind of research issue is not because I'm going to get a PhD here doing this kind of research. Oh, so you you want to combine those two? Yeah. And the creator, the yeah. new research in yeah. this issue, okay. Yeah, you got it. Because it's being ignored. Because right now, this kind of um, this kind of issue is becoming more and more known. Mm -hmm. People are not saying you should teach vocabulary anymore because it, the vocabulary lists don't work. Mm -hmm. So it's a new research. This is a new direction. Okay. okay. And I'm the leader, so. For the new direction. Okay, I got it. Yeah. I can recommend a book to you if you are interested to talk about this kind of this kind of research. Okay, thank you. <laughs> it's not you can take it from my desk. And so I want to ask you, this is this is the point I want to ask you now. So are researchers really doing what they say they are doing? Okay. Here's what I'm trying to say that about the word. What is a word? To you, what is a word? 
Is this a, is this a word, a single word? Taiwan, do you think Taiwan is a word? It's not a difficult question. Is Taiwan a word? Is up a word? So I can say it's vocabulary. It's one vocabulary. Maybe. Right? But what is the meaning of that vocabulary? It's hard to say. It's hard to say. Unless you know more of more vocabulary and other things about a vocabulary, it's hard for you to be able to know what is the meaning of that vocabulary. If you, if you, if you no. learn a word in English, and you don't learn the opposite of that word. Do you really know fully the, the first word you learn? If you learn learn the word hard in English, do you really understand what is the meaning of hard if you don't know the meaning of soft? But I think there is two problems. One is what is a word? The second one is what is mean I learn a word. Yeah, I talked about it already. Yeah. So, the question is: Is this is a word means we we have to use double conditions rules because I think it's totally different. I, I can know this is dog, but I it doesn't mean I know what is dog. My my point is: It's hard to define the word without understanding the context that in which it's surrounded. For example, if 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 you hear, I give you a very a very a very dramatic example. Um, if if someone says, "Hey, bitch," uh -huh. if you hear this word, unless you understand the context in which it's said, the word "bitch" could rude you could be you rude. That? Or it can mean somebody's joking with their friend, or it can be a term of endearment, meaning that's the nickname somebody has given someone. Or it could just be that somebody is calling a dog, because a female dog is a bitch. So therefore, unless you know the context of this utterance, it's hard to know the meaning of the word. That is the main point I'm trying to make. No other point. Unless you know context, unless you have the context, it's very hard to single out the, the meaning of a vocabulary. But somehow there's levels of thinking because, for example, if I will try, uh, the, mom, the teacher or mother will point, take a picture, for example, yeah. of the people. Okay, yeah. They tell us, okay, this is people. Mm -hmm. So we learn the word people, but there's no context. Yeah. Yep. But I think your context is a teacher, you have some link. But maybe you, that's why I said before there, you will have some, you will have some, you will have some, um, some level of understanding of this word, but maybe you haven't grasped all of it. I think we are all saying the same thing. What I'm trying, the main point I'm trying to say is, it's very hard to just um, narrow down the definition of a word without looking at other other factors, right? So the problem is what the what the average. Sorry, verge, verge, 边缘, 边界, adage. You don't understand. edge. Uh, yeah, well, whatever is surrounding, I think. I think that's my meaning of the word when I say context. So, I, I, in my reading experience, 
yes. some research or scholar they will use a trick way to figure out those kind of problem. He will say there is a narrow definition or a broad, broad definition. So could you agree with those kind of way to definite the word a word. Maybe we have two kind of definition. The way to define the word O in the narrow way A narrow way is like the researchers in this uh, in this um, in all the research studies I talked about today. A group of letters separated by white space on a page. So you you can agree with those kind of narrow down definition. No. Uh -huh. So you want to create or support a bro? Not create, mm -hmm. I will support bro other support. researchers. Okay. Yeah. Because there is already a lot of research about that certain language, there are certain language chunks mm -hmm. that occur. A, a lot of words appear nearby each other in a language. It's very frequent. They spin, they, they are in close proximity. Not only collocations, mm -hmm. certain words always come together. We don't know why, it's just the way it is in the language. Like, why do we say take med, why do I say take medicine instead of eat medicine? It's just the way it is in English. And it's a collocation, these words collocate, meaning that they, they appear close together. But you can take it one step closer and say that there are chunks of language, there are sequences. If you're interested, I can give you more. I will talk more about it oh, that's great. next time, and that's I can true. give, I can let you read some some articles okay. about language chunking. <laughs> Cookie. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so now is the question and answer time. <laughs> I found we already started. <laughs> yeah. So this is the guy that you read his his paper. So um, he's a, ma a master's program director, and his research interests are vocabulary acquisition, extensive reading, and extensive listening. So he's doing the work on collocations. And also lexical domains of television programs and movies. So how to watch TV and, and movies. So I have the questions <laughs> and the answer for each. So the question number one. So besides from the information in table, one, table four, it showed that generally the score of productive knowledge is lower than the score of recipient knowledge. Does it show that in instrumental learning context, productive knowledge is more difficult to acquire than accepted knowledge. And my answer is, I, I think I would be surprised if a researcher would use the term more difficult to describe the process of acquisition of receptive knowledge of a work. Um, I think that the researcher would probably say it takes less exposure to a vocabulary. Like maybe we need less exposures to this vocabulary to have it idea of certain types of receptive knowledge about the vocabulary. Does everybody understand my the answer to my question? To the question? Like I don't think that a researcher would say that it's more difficult to um, acquire um, the ability to produce a vocabulary word than to receive and understand a vocabulary. I think they would, in, instead, they would just say it takes less exposure because they would be afraid to say this kind of thing. The, 
from table four, it shows that even you expose the word 10, 10 times, it still scores very lower from the product, productive test. Yes. So, but, it, but when you expose the word for 10 times, it, the subject look better in receptive yeah. test. So, it seems that even you do more, you, you have more exposure time, you still do worse in productive test. So I, I thought, I, I, I'm just saying that I don't think, um, I think it's quite obvious, like, that, well, I'm not saying that's not true, because I think if, for all of us, when we can sit and we can listen to language and we feel it's easier to understand, it's, it will be easier to understand than, than uh, producing that language. I'm not disagreeing, but I'm just saying that I don't think a researcher would say it in this way. I'm a, I, I think they would be afraid to make this claim. That's my point. Like I think most of the researchers would just say, oh, it takes less exposure to the word to be able to make it part of your receptive. I think it requires, of course, I think, there's, another, there's another researcher that says that not only do you have to have input in the, in the language, but you also have to have um, output. So can we say that reading is not enough to acquire the production knowledge? Ooh, it's hard to. It's, I think it's hard to. It's hard to say this, but there is some. There's some researchers that they, they, um, they talked about input and output, and uh, um, the cost. The cost is different. In, uh, input and output. Okay. According to the recent research I read, uh, they mentioned not the difficulty and. They mentioned, the, of course, the time of the podium and mm -hmm. also the somehow cognitive cost or something, something like that. I don't like the, 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 the things I've read is, <coughs> is only about, the, they talked about the, more about um, speaking, but they didn't talk about reading, but it was like coronas and gas, the researchers, and they said, like they compared like the um, negative study, they, like I said before, they wanted to control for for a lot of variables because the author felt that the past research was not designed very well. So they tried to isolate as many variables as, as possible um, because all the previous studies had all different results. So he wanted to have a very tightly controlled research. Yeah, so I said there's a lot of things that are affected, like context and um, so he, he chose so many different variables because he wanted to also see the different steps that you could learn of a vocabulary. Like, could you learn what would be easier to learn, maybe, or what would be the first one to learn? Would it be spelling or grammar or whatever? So that's why there are so many different measures of the test. Mm -hmm. And I think that I think about, I don't know, like I thought about the, if the students would be too tired from the different tests. So there are 10 tests and 10 words for each test. So it would, it would be about 100 questions in total. Um, but actually, the, I think about the time that students take TOEFL or TOEIC or those kind of tests, it's for a long period of time and it's a much more difficult test than the questions that he had to do because some of them were very easy and I don't think it would take a lot of brain power. But TOEIC and TOEFL is very hard and students can still do it. So I think, I think it's okay and some of the students, they didn't need to read so long because 
the ones that were in the lower number of exposures, they even needed to read less, and there was a break, I think, a little bit before. I think it's, it's, not a, it's not a big problem here, because there are a lot more more difficult tests than here. Um, also, the, the next question, so the researchers said that the total number of subjects and you're worried about the number of subjects, so I, and also about the missing tables. So I sent you the tables, yeah. yeah. But don't ask me about the tables because I didn't prepare them. But you can download it here. And also, I think the reason you're missing the subjects is because of the statistics, um, because there is. Uh, I think you can read about the statistics by yourself, but it's because it's n minus 1 for the control and also for the, for the experimental group. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, so that's why there are two missing subjects, because they need to, you need to come up with a standard deviation. Do you, under, do you understand, Cindy? Do you understand? Huh? I know what you mean. You know what I mean? Yes. Okay. It's, I, have a, I have a learning disability in math, so it's very difficult for me to understand. I'm serious. It's very difficult for me to understand um, mathematics and be able to explain it. But I think you can ask others. Um, the subjects are still there, and there's a reason why they, why you need to why you need to delete one from each each group. Because we don't have the because it's just a sample. Yeah. Okay, and the next question. The researchers research objectives seem to be related to blah 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 blah. But then he switches gears and seems to focus on acquisition of uh, productive versus receptive knowledge of vocabulary. In, so in the literature review, he does not discuss these areas. Only later does it mention briefly the faint differences between the two. Is that about what you mean? Yeah. Um, I also agree with your observation because I think that um, I think he was making the focus of his article on effective repetition of the vocabulary. And um, there has been an overemphasis on this kind of repetition for a long time. And I think also because the author wanted to publish another paper. So he has another paper. And you can, I will send you the abstract. And here, he takes the same data and he analyzes it for the things you mentioned. So I guess he wanted to publish two papers because this paper was um, earlier, so I think he um, just wanted two different papers from the data, so that's why he, he didn't mention it. Yeah. Do you understand, right? Yeah. Okay, I will send it to you. Okay, so the researcher formed experimental and control groups, but on the whole, having a control group almost seems meaningless. The researcher seems to focus mostly on the comparisons between the experimental group control group is used to compare the final results only of the dictation of the made up words. It seems the control group cannot produce a very strong contrast. The control group cannot show that the experimental group was very strong. It cannot help to bring out the importance of experimental design and an explanation could not be found in the discussion section either, leaving me unaware of the intention of having a control group. Is it about your meeting? Yeah. Chongdo? Okay. So, um, I think that it's helpful to have a control in the experimental group, but I think that um, that actually the control group doesn't really mean very much in this kind of situation because just like the example I gave earlier to you, like with I give you guys a lecture today, but if I give you a test and I give somebody on the street a test, of course, you guys will do better because you had some exposure. But the control group, you know, they don't have any. They don't have any chance to learn anything. So of course, they will. 
they will score very low. So there's not really a lot of a need to talk about the control group because if you talk too much about the control group, a lot of people will say, of course, they learned some, the, the experimental group is better than the control. They didn't have anything different. They didn't have any input, it's not fair. And the last question. I think I, yeah. I sent you the answer to this question yeah, about intentional learning and incidental learning, and we already talked about the difference in the, in the, in the class. You mean, uh, yeah, you mean uh, what you said? Yeah, I think it's very similar. So it's hard to distinguish incidental and intentional versus implicit and explicit. Yeah. But I think it just comes down to uh, terminology. You know, you have to see when you read research in, in whatever area of your, that you're it's your expertise to see what kind of terms they use to describe certain phenomena. Just like I said to you, like actually in the research, I told you, I explained it first what is incidental and intentional, but then later I said, but actually in the research, the real meaning is just the difference between telling students before whether they have a test or not. So you have to look at the definition. Yeah, of the whatever research. So, but yeah, I also think it's it's very similar. But you you have to look and see how they use the vocabulary word because you have to look at the context of where the word is used. Okay, so from the result of the E3 group, it suggests that knowledge of orthography, grammatical function, syntax developed earlier than meaning. If so, why does the researcher put the nonsense words in the text? Why are these nonsense? What are these nonsense words for? Do these nonsense words represent the meaning or grammatical function of the normal words or something else? So, yeah, all of the, if you just replace a, if you just replace a word and you are, you replace the same word, the, only that word throughout a whole text with any symbol, it can be just a mark or it can be a made up word or whatever, it will be okay because we know there's a missing piece here and we can um, and we can um, try to guess what is the meaning of that word. Because just like with English, if you think about it with it's only a it's only a symbol. That's the only thing it is. I'm not exactly for sure and if all of the words follow the same grammatical rules of English, like if there should be an S or an ES, those kind of thing, on the end of the words or not. But in the previous studies, they did control for this, but he doesn't exactly mention it very directly in this study, but I would think so. And the purpose of the made-up words is where you don't need a pretest, like we said before. And Did I kind of answer your question? Because I'm curious, uh, when the researcher put the nonsense words into the test, so when the participants in the test, how and where do they get a clue to find the word? Yeah, that's the, that would be more, that would be better research. That would be more qualitative research to try to figure out, yeah, what kind, what things led them to the, to be able to guess this word. It will be the context. That's a good. That's the the thing that people are not looking at. That's that's good. Just simply uh, replace the word. Uh, the normal word is the nonsense word. So yeah. Kind. It's, it's kind of comparison. No? For example, I. There are four words in this sentence, and so I replace one word with another one. So when I uh, the others understand, okay. yeah. so I compare these two sentences and find out okay, this this word are different. So I replace in my I replace this word with another. You mean I'm not exactly sure what? Uh, what I mean is. Uh, actually, I don't know if the leader really know the 
grammatical uh, function of the meaning of this the nonsense word stand for. So yeah, that's what the, the different yeah. tests were trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. If the if the they they answer for example uh, if for example the nonsense word that was gone was a noun and they wrote a sentence but they used they wrote the nonsense word as a verb then they haven't learned how to, they don't, they don't know it's a, a noun. Do you get what I'm saying? Like if there's a, if for example, there's a nonsense word called L-E, Lee, and it's actually the real word is boy, and then, um, and then they read a sentence. Um, I saw the, the Lee, and, they, and then when they were tested later, they were told, you need to use this word in a sentence. And, they, and then they wrote, I, um, Lee, uh, I Lee a gift. Here it's functioning as a verb, but here it's functioning as an object of the sentence, but it's also a noun. So, that means they did not. Um, they did not acquire this knowledge about this vocabulary word. That it's uh, in the noun position. But if they could have answered the, the question correctly, then that would have meant that if they could have write, wrote a sentence correctly, then that would have meant that they had. You could also test this with multiple choice ways as well. In your second question, so, uh, so here. Oh, yeah, this is this is very tricky because he said that there are four EFL classes, but he also wrote that the participants were from one EFL class at the end of the same paragraph. So here's my understanding when I reread and read very deeply and look at the context of what he wrote in the paragraph. If you go back and read this paragraph, you will see it's very confusing because he says first it's from four ESL classes, and then later he says um, he says one e EFL class. So it's very confusing. But from my understanding, is that all the participants from the study, all of them, were from four different classes, but the control group participants were selected from a single class. Um, it's a little ambiguous, so I don't know if some of the experimental group participants were also from the same class as the control. But I'm for sure all of the control group subjects, they all came from the same class. But I don't know if some of the students from the same class as the control was also part of the, um, the experimental group. So you read this very deeply. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't notice it at all. So here are all the references from today. So if you are interested, I can send you the references. And thanks for your attention. <laughs>